Gilwood Atfield have done brilliantly. I think it's a, a terrific idea. One of the things that Mick and I agree on is that there is insufficient awareness in our trade and in, you know, in, in journalism and in the whole communications industry about these issues. There is a sort of uh, reflex of people assuming they know what's going on or alternatively not wanting to know what's going on or hiding from it. And I think all of these things need to be addressed and this is a fantastic initiative. It is terrific that we in this case have a room of more or less equal size uh, because if you look in the press, I don't think you'll find that um, we get a room of equal size as it were in, in newspaper coverage. Um, if it were the newspapers, we'd be, we'd be, there'd be this room and there'd be a little box in the corner over there for hacked off. But I, in my career in journalism, I have challenged some vested interests. I've, I've written extensively about policing and, and, and particularly the Metropolitan Police. They didn't like it very much. I've written quite extensively about uh, things to do with the army. They didn't like that very much either. I've written about some quite big corporations. Uh, they didn't like it very much. Um, I assume I was performing my natural role as a journalist. I think it's interesting when I started performing what I thought was my natural role as a journalist, challenging uh, the corporations that run our national press, I suddenly became an enemy of journalism. How did that happen? What I think journalists are supposed to do, what we do all the time, in fact, is we identify where things are going wrong, we point a finger, we say, there is something wrong, we ask, and you read the leader columns, they're very fluent in this stuff, we, some of you have had experience of it, I dare say, uh, we ask that people be made accountable, that the truth be dragged out, and we ask that the public is shown that the lessons have been learned and things have changed, and it's not going to happen again. Those are the sorts of things we ask. And it struck me, particularly I think when I was looking at the, the McCann case, that this just doesn't happen in our own industry. We are not capable of looking ourselves in the mirror and saying, no, that won't do. We have to improve. We don't engage in that dialogue. Indeed, it's much worse than that. Because what we do is we cover up our wrongdoing. The, the story of the McCanns is prominent in the sins that were committed. We now know about them. They were not very well reported when, when they were finally exposed as, as, as gross libels. But much more pertinent is the case of phone hacking. Phone hacking was simply not reported in any newspaper but The Guardian for years. Simple as that. Um, the count has been done. I think in four years, The Guardian published 237 stories about phone hacking. Um, you might think that, for example, Mirror Group newspapers uh, would have published, national newspapers would have published a lot of articles about phone hacking. Deadly rivals, aren't they? Supposed to be deadly rivals of the sun, the news of the world, so forth. Don't you think they might have been, wanted to, to expose for purely competitive reasons uh, that or Indeed, God help us, in the public interest, they might want to be exposed. No. Eleven articles appeared in those four years in Mirror, Mirror National Papers. And of those eleven, most were ones that were saying, this isn't a story at all, or it's about something different. Or the Guardian is you know, pursuing some political vendetta here. That's just the Mirror. I mean, there were 35, I think it is, um, in, the, um, in the Mail Papers. At, against 237 in The Guardian. This was a huge scandal involving the hacking of phones of people they're usually quite interested in. I mean, there was a time when Sienna Miller only had to change her hat. She'd be guaranteed in, a headline in the, in, in, in the tabloids. But funnily enough, when she was hacked and reduced to a state of misery by a national paper, that wasn't news at all. This is not acceptable. It's simply not acceptable. And it is not the exercise of the free press, of the freedom of the press. It is the exercise of the freedom of newspaper corporations to bully people with impunity. And that's basically the story that gets told in the other room. There is a long history of this. Leveson said seven inquiries in 70 years, of which the first six, as he used to say, and this was rather <coughs> depressing for a, for a journalism academic, the first six just got ended up on the shelves of journalism academics. And I can vouch for it. I have them. Uh, we can't go on like that. Why can't we go on like that? Because we live in a rights-based society where actually there are victims here. It's not a casual business of, 
of being able to say, oh yeah, well, uh, you know, you take the rough with the smooth with the press. Well, you know, I can tell you that the, <laughs> the editors of national newspapers take the smooth, but it is people like the McCanns and Christopher Jeffries who take the rough. Now, do we just turn away from them? And it's not just them. There are thousands of people. There are at least a thousand victims of phone hacking. There are four or five thousand victims of the Motorman intrusions. Probably a worse scandal in many ways. Per people's personal private data was stolen, unbeknownst to them. Probably four or five thousand. There are who knows how many victims of bullying, fabrication, distortion, forms of blackmail by national papers, harassment. You've seen the stuff. You heard the evidence at Leveson. This is not something that we can take casually as a civilized society. Something has to be done. What Leveson recommended and what the Royal Charter approved by every single party in Parliament uh, embodies is a system that will be painstakingly independent of the press and of the politicians. And it's curious that the, the press version of a Royal Charter opens the way for working politicians to be members of the bodies regulating the press. We in Act Off thought that was un unsuitable. And actually, so did Lord Justice Leveson, and so did Parliament. But the press wants the politicians in there. Why would that be? Could it be because they're actually used to being able to manipulate politicians? They know what to do with them. <coughs> well, we think that's not about the freedom of the press. It is painstakingly protective of the freedom of the press from the politicians. It is also provides a self-regulator that is independent of the industry to a degree that the public could have trust in it. The problem with the PCC was that they had a code written by editors which they only enforced when it didn't inconvenience editors. Well, something has to change. And, and you know, the principle of the code, the principle of regulation was conceded years ago. That's not, that's not an issue here. The principle that's at stake it now... Be. It should be an issue, Brian. Okay, the principle that's at stake now is whether it makes any difference and I think that the proposal in the Royal Charter is actually contrary to the scaremongering, hysterical propaganda that you're reading. The principle of the Royal Charter endorsed by Parliament is a fair, simple, modest proposal to effect change here, to protect ordinary people from the worst that these corporate uh, pseudo-journalists can throw at them.